Without further ado, we're going to bring on Judy Murray, OBE. And I hope you can hear me back there, but can you now give them a massive round of applause? So glad I didn't trip going down the stairs there. <laughs> I didn't really know what I was coming into, but um, thanks for the introduction. Oh. I could hear you through the door. Oh, right. Very oh, was impressive. Okay. Was it impressive? Oh, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to get the, the evening on the way with a, a sort of 15 minute chat to Judy about sort of how she started in tennis and just go through her career and, you know, as a mother to the boys of Jamie and Andy and all those sorts of things. Okay. So let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. I'm absolutely loving your school. You are so lucky to study here. It's absolutely stunning. And uh, for any of you who are coming to the tennis master classes tomorrow, I will look forward to being out there with you. And hopefully there's, there's sunshine like today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how did it all begin for you, the tennis? Um, I started playing tennis when I was about 10. Uh, I'm very, very old. So when I was 10, people played with wooden rackets and wooden rackets were very long and they were very heavy. So you had to be at least 10 before you actually could manage a wooden racket. And I was quite fortunate because my mum and dad both played tennis at our local club and they also both played for our county. They were both county captains for the north of Scotland. Um, so they both played tennis to a reasonable level. Um, so they taught me how to play the game and as I kind of got better at it. I was able to play with the older uh, teenagers at the club and also with the adults. So there was no such thing as tennis coaches when I was young. You just learned to play the game with older, more expo experienced people at, uh, at your club. It's a very different yes. tennis world to what we have today. What we have today, absolutely. Um, so you played and you got 64 national titles. That's incredible. <laughs> I know, do you know it sounds really good doesn't it but I have to say that in Scotland where our weather is truly dreadful when I was young there were no such thing as indoor tennis courts so I played tennis in the summer and I played badminton in the winter and for my school I went to a girls school my dad sent me there because I loved sports so much and I played in pretty much every school team that was going I absolutely loved all sports but tennis and badminton would be my would be my two things that I, I suppose that I kind of excelled in. But tennis in Scotland was very much a minority sport because you couldn't play all year round. So nobody aspired to be a great player, nobody aspired to be a great coach um, in those days. And actually the draws for most of the, the competitions, especially in, at ladies level, women's level, were actually pretty small. But you can only beat who's in front of you. and. Um, I managed to stay at the top of the game in Scotland actually for for quite a long time, but it was a it was quite a small pool, I have to say. <laughs> um, professional tour, 1976, was that right? Yeah, I, le I left school after fifth year. Um, I did a deal with my dad that if I got um, good grades in my hires, that's what we called them in Scotland, that and I got a guaranteed place at university that I could take a year off to see how good I could become at at tennis. And um, so I, I took that year and I went off on my own. My dad had his own business, my mum was looking after my two younger brothers and in those days there weren't very many flights. Flying was was something that was still relatively new. Um, there was no such thing as the internet or an ATM machine or a mobile phone. So I took off uh, into Europe to try and play tournaments. So I was in effect coaching myself and looking after myself as well, trying to get myself into events, get myself to and from events, um, play them, um, move on to the next tournament. And you're very disconnected in those days in a way that all of you are so connected or have the opportunity to be connected all the time with all the screens and gadgets that, there are, that are now available. But I think back then, when I look back, it was probably quite dangerous. And I was about 17 and I, I sort of took off on my own. But I wanted to try and do it. And I didn't last very long because after about four months, I was playing in a, a competition in Barcelona. 
and I went to pick up some money that my parents had wired to me at the post restaurant. That is actually the post office. But that was how you got money in those days. They would wire, wire it to the post office in whatever city you were in. You went, you went there in person, showed your passport, and you picked it up. So I went, picked up my money, put it in my bag, got on a bus back up to the hotel. When I got off the bus, the bus had been packed and I didn't realize that somebody had opened my bag and taken my wallet out of my bag. My wallet had my passport in it, my tickets, um, it had all the money that I just picked up from the post office. And what I remember so clearly about that was like almost not, not believing it, not wanting to believe it, and sitting on the pavement opening and reopening my bag in the hope that one of the times when I reopened it, it would magically appear that my wallet was, was there again. Anyway, I then had to find a way to cope with that. And so I thought, right, problem solving. I'm good at problem solving. I really like when somebody presents me with a challenge and I have to find a way out of it. So I thought, right, find a policeman. So I found a policeman, he didn't speak English. I had to find another policeman who could speak enough English. Um, took me to the police station, con connected me with the embassy. Uh, cut a long story short, I managed to get a uh, a document that would replace my passport to allow me to go home, did a reverse charge call from the police station to my parents to tell them what had happened and my dad basically said, you need to come home, it's too dangerous for you, you can't do this by yourself. And so I went home, I did a secretarial course in the next sort of four months, I kind of crash course of shorthand and typing and then I went to university. But I really believe that that experience of really wanting to try to become a tennis player and there being no infrastructure or system in place in my country and therefore no opportunity really formed me many years later when I went into coaching and I wanted to give other Scottish kids the chance to, if they were good enough and they wanted to try, I wanted to put an infrastructure in place for them to be able to do that. And that's what I did because we are all products of our environment and we're all formed by our experiences. So that was one of the experiences I think that kind of led me to what eventually I, I started to do. Brilliant. Okay, so really, um, how did you get into coaching then really? How, what would they? Well, it was quite interesting how I got into coaching. I did a degree at Edinburgh University, I did French and Business Studies. and. Um, I had a, a couple of jobs before I had uh, got married and had my kids. And on the day that Andy was due to be born, we moved house from Glasgow to Dunblane. Dunblane was the small village in the centre of Scotland where I was brought up. And we moved back there so that I had some more help with Jamie and Andy. They were 15 months apart, um, so they were quite challenging when they were, when they, when they were very small. And so I got back to Dunblane and I had to give up my job um, and my job had a car with it. And I felt very stuck in the house with two very young children, no job, no car, no tennis club, no fr no, none of my friends, etc., etc. And I went over and joined Dunblane Tennis Club, which is where I'd been a member when I was a kid and discovered that there was still no coaching, um, still nobody doing anything for the juniors, and I offered to volunteer for a couple of hours a week. I was the Scottish number one at the time, so although I wasn't a coach, I knew how to play the game, and I knew, I thought I would probably know how to teach others how to play the game. And so I started on two hours a week, and as I was doing, doing my, my sessions, I guess, um, more and more parents asked if their kids could join in. So I started to trade tennis sessions for childcare. <laughs> so basically we had no money. Um, I was doing all these sessions for free and, I, and we had a super clubhouse at our little tennis club in Dunblane. And I said, look, I bring all their toys down. I can see them from the court through into the clubhouse windows. And if you could just look after them, play with them, I could do another hour <laughs> here and there. And that was how it grew. And as, as I, I, of course, being a tennis player, I realized you need competitions, you need club teams, you need school teams, you need events, et cetera, et cetera, because the fun of sport is playing the game. It's not endless coaching sessions, it's actually playing the game, or it certainly is for most people. So um, I started to create some competitions and I started to create some club teams. And then I brought all the mums together and I said, look, here's all the things we could do, but I can't do them all. I've got two little kids, blah, blah, blah. And so um, we created a mum's army and all the mums got involved in running the cafe, running the teams, running competitions, running social nights. <coughs> and we created this incredible community tennis club hub for lots and lots of families in the area. 
And of course, Jamie and Andy were very small at that stage, but by the time that they got old enough or big enough to be able to play the game, they had an enormous supply of older children, boys and girls, to play not just tennis with them, table tennis, water bomb fights, football in the park, cricket, swing ball, all the things that we'd set up at the club. And I really believe that that environment was what helped them to fall in love with the game and gave them a kind of endless supply of practice yeah. partners. Yeah, brilliant, great. So I'm, ve I'm very good at long answers, by the <laughs> way. <laughs> I'll just check what I was going to say next. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, if you expand on sort of like your coaching roles, I mean, your coaching roles have been outstanding. I mean, obviously coaching the Federation Cup, I mean, that must have been a real privilege to do that and you enjoyed that experience. Obviously, the experience you've had with Andy and Jamie as they've grown up and gone through all these tournaments and everything you've done. Is there anything you can tell about those years, those years that uh, you can tell any of the children about or how it was for them when yeah. you were going through it? It's, um, I think that if I had known back then how tough it is to develop a young player or young players through, through tennis, it's not only very difficult, it's incredibly expensive. And I think when you live in Scotland and you are such a long way from where the heart of everything is in terms of British tennis, which of course is probably Midlands and further south, um, you know, it's very, you can very quickly outgrow your own environment. And then if you need competition that requires you to travel further afield, you need somebody who can take you. Uh, you need a whole lot of extra time and you need a whole lot of extra extra money and when you then outgrow your country and you have to play internationally whether that's on the tennis europe junior tour or the itf tour which is the international kind of under 18 tour you know you you need a lot of funds to to make that happen and i think that first of all i had to learn how to coach and you know i did a number of qualifications including the the one that i did with the with mr shaw which lasted for a year yes. and that was where we 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 became friends uh, doing that that course and i learned a lot on that course but i learned a lot of information it didn't form me it didn't make me into a great coach it just gave me a lot of information which i then had to go and work with and apply and there was nobody for me to learn from in Scotland. So it really had to be about me learning for myself. But I also understood that if I invested in myself, I was investing in all the kids that I had at the club and in the wider, in the wider area. So I think that when Jamie and Andy were eight and nine, they were playing in under 10, some under 10 competitions, some under 12 competitions, and they were playing the men's third team at our club and they were playing with guys who were in their 60s, so it was all doubles. And I remember the very first uh, night that Andy got the chance to play in the men's third team, and he was playing with a guy who was a very eminent architect. He had designed the Sky Road Bridge, and he lived just up the road from us. And I went down to watch, and I was sitting on the wall, and uh, they warmed up, and then Andy went to serve first, and he was bouncing the ball, just about to serve, and then he ran up to the net to speak to his partner, and his partner, if you can picture the net was here, his partner, if that was his racket, his racket was almost over the net and he was like this, very, very, very close to the net and kind of almost hanging over the net. And Andy went to say something to him and the guy stepped back about three steps. Anyway, the, the match finished and uh, they came off and, and I said to Andy, I said, what, what did you say to John at the start of the match? And he said, well, mum, he said, I told him that I wanted to serve and volley. He's eight years old, he can hardly see over the net. I wanted to serve and volley. <laughs> And I told him that he was standing far too close to the net and that if he got lobbed, because he was very old, he was never going to be able to run back and get the lob. So he had to step back a bit. And I was thinking to myself, oh no. <laughs> um, but actually, what, the other thing that I was thinking was, already he's working out how to play the game. He knows what he wants to do. He knows how to make it. He knows what he's seen on TV that he likes. He wants to try, he wants to try it out. But nowadays, if my kids were playing tennis age eight and nine, they wouldn't have that freedom of variety of competition because of the restrictions around the colors of tennis balls. If you all play tennis, you'll know what I mean by red, orange, and green balls and different sizes of courts. There's a lot more restriction around it, and yes. I think they would actually find it quite dull, yes. to, to be fair. Yeah. But I'll tell you I've, um, another little story about when they were 10 and 11, they got selected to go overseas for the first time with the LTA, which 
was kind of a British team. And uh, it was an event in France and it cost me a fortune for them to go, but I wanted them to have the opportunity because the trip left from London. So I had three flights to London, taxi to where they were meeting the minibus that was taking them across. Then I had to get a taxi back, then I had to fly home, and then I had to fly down to pick them up and take them back again. So the whole thing cost me a fortune. I remember borrowing the money from my mum because I really wanted them to have the chance to go. And they had a great time. They played in a number of different clubs and schools, you know, school halls with zillions of lines all over them, no, no flashy clubs or anything like that. But the first impression of anything, especially when it's something that's out of your comfort zone like that, if it's a good one, it fills you with huge confidence. And um, Andy made the semi-final and he lost to a guy called Gail Monfils. Now you might not know who Gail Monfils is, but Gail Monfils made top 10 for, for quite a number of years. He's the most wonderful athlete, um, a French player, absolute nutcase great fun to watch but when he was 11 he was the same mad as a hatter great athlete anyway Gail Monfils beats Andy in three sets and Jamie gets to the final and plays Gail Monfils and beats Gail Monfils six love six one so Jamie has a great tournament wins loads of matches makes lots of friends learns how to keep the score in French is able to look after himself for three or four days with this squad wonderful experience comes back with his little trophy and uh, for about three months after they got home, all I heard were from Andy was, he only won because I tired him out. <laughs> <laughs> but the sibling rivalry between Andy and Jamie, I really think that made, um, or certainly helped to make Andy the kind of uber competitor that he became because he only ever wanted to beat Jamie. He was 50 months older, a bit bigger, a bit stronger for most of the formative years, and he only ever wanted to beat Jamie at everything and I think he learned a lot from having an mm. older brother and when Andy won Wimbledon the first time in 2013 the day after uh, he had a whole lot of media obligations to do which are royally boring so dull and then he came home at lunchtime and, uh, and and Jamie came round and Jamie came in the door and Andy was sitting watching the TV and Jamie said game of table tennis Andy and Andy went yep all right and I thought oh god here we go <laughs> and they went outside to the table tennis table and then they came in about five minutes later and Jamie came in and he flung the table tennis bat across the room and he went I'm never playing table tennis with him again and Andy's standing at the door going oh go on Jamie I'll, I'll play you with my left hand and it was so funny for me because I'm thinking he just won Wimbledon he's the first Brit to win Wim British man to win Wimbledon in 77 years and all he wanted to do was was beat his brother at um at table tennis it was like just going completely back into the, the family like like the what had happened two days before had had never happened <laughs> that's a fantastic answer knowing the score you wrote this fabulous book yeah. i did yeah so and um bit of a dancer i believe in the past with uh, strictly come dancing you did uh, <laughs> you did a little bit of that i did strictly come dancing um, do any of you watch strictly come dancing yeah, yeah. Well, well i, she, I did it a long did it. time ago yeah, and you, time ago, you yeah. and hopefully you ne hopefully you never yeah. saw it um, <laughs> she you, got to week eight <laughs> <laughs> you can actually find good. it on youtube but uh, yeah, and you it, 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 it is very good fun but yeah. i think with something like doing something like that it gives you a chance to see behind the scenes of somebody else's world you know it's completely different from the world of sport and it was for me really putting myself out of my comfort zone to do something that I'd never done before so forth but I mean that's a lesson in life is very important to keep stepping out of your comfort zone keep pushing your limits it's the only way really that that we grow but <laughs> and the chase and you got at quizzes do you know, it, it, it's an interesting thing with some of the quiz things. I did The Weakest Link recently, and I did actually did really well on that. I've no idea why. I think you're just lucky what questions you get. But when I did The Chase, I love watching The Chase, and it's a completely different thing when you're standing there facing Bradley Walsh or the governess and being asked a question, and you know there's a big, big audience behind you, and it's very difficult to think under pressure. And even though I spent so much of my working life teaching players how to perform under pressure, I couldn't actually do it myself. My mind was all over the place, and I gave some absolutely dreadful, embarrassing answers. Who is your favorite sports hero? Um, that's a good question. 
Yeah, I, it's definitely Billie Jean King. So you younger people in the audience, you might not know who Billie Jean King is, but when I was your age, she was my favorite tennis player. Uh, she's 77 years old now. Uh, she's a, she was the, the woman who 50 years ago started almost like a revolution in tennis to set up a women's tour, a separate women's tour. She and nine other women were so fed up with the men taking 90% of the gate, that's the, the money that comes in, uh, at the tennis tournaments and the women just getting 10% that they formed their own association, really started from scratch. They got blackballed all over the place. Um, but she is the reason why tennis is the most equal of all of the sports um, out there today. The women's tour uh, on, on tennis, uh, tennis players are probably the best paid female athletes um, out there. The biggest uh, tennis is biggest visibility on TV, most potential for endorsements, etc., etc., and equal prize money, of course, at the Grand Slam. So she is my uh, my absolute hero, and she doesn't just speak out about gender equality. She speaks out about equality in all sorts of things, and she does it consistently. Um, I've just finished listening to her audio book, which she talks herself, and I feel like she's in the car with me. So uh, yeah, sh she's my she's number one. one. Okay. And uh, another question, uh, somebody sent in, who inspired you as a young athlete? Did anybody inspire you when you were younger? As a, when you were? I think, I, think it, I would have to go back to her again. again. You know, as a, as a young tennis player, she was the one I watched on TV. But, you know, when I was young, you had black and white Wimbledon, and that was about it. Now you've pretty much got tennis on Amazon Prime or BT Sport. It's probably on pretty much every week but it wasn't back then. Right. Another question. Um, tell us about your greatest achievement to date. That's yeah, a difficult one, isn't it? You've done so many things, but tell us about your greatest achievement. What is your greatest achievement, do you think? Wow. Yeah, I don't It's a combination of that. I don't know, probably getting to week eight at Strictly, that was a major achievement. <laughs> yeah. I think um, I was always bottom, second bottom, or third bottom of the leaderboard, and every week my partner, Anton Dubeck, would say, they've got it upside down again, partner. <laughs> um, but I think that I stayed until week eight because of Andy's fans, Anton's fans, and the whole of Scotland voting for me. Um, but really, if it was just based on ability, I probably should have been out in week one. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's give you another one. What would be the, uh, the sport of your choice if it wasn't tennis? Would oh, it be easy. easy, darts. Darts. I actually, darts, I actually really love darts. I love watching darts. I love the precision under pressure when, when, when the matches are tight. But I've actually just started learning golf. And like I said before, when I was young, I did tennis in the summer and I did badminton in the winter. And I played for Scotland at badminton and I was the British University's badminton champion. Not a lot of people know that. I, I, somebody reminded me of that when I was doing one of these once before, somebody in the audience who was played badminton with me and I went, I'd completely forgotten that, that <laughs> I actually was quite good at badminton as well. Easy. Brings back memories. Um, couple of other, some other questions here. Um, who is the most naturally gifted player you've witnessed? Naturally gifted. There's, there's, there's actually a lot. I mean, it's hard lot. to see past Roger Federer. Mm. Um, but I also think somebody like Nick Kyrgios is incredibly naturally gifted. He's quite crazy, but he's very, Who very knows gifted. Who Kyrgios is? Not personally. Oh, that's impressive. It's amazing what he, what he can do with the ball. And uh, I, I don't think you'll have heard of this guy, but there was a French player called Fabrice Santoro. He played double-handed both sides, and he chopped it on one side. And, and spun it on the other side, but he was he was known as the magician, and he's worth looking up on YouTube. Quite incredible talent. So the one I thought of was Henry Lecomte. Do you remember Henry? Le yeah. Yeah. Talented guy. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. Let's move on. Um, let's give you another question. This is a good one for actually a lot of you pupils out here. What advice would you give to calm butterflies before a competition? You know when you get that. Oh, that all that nerv all that nervousness. Who gets nervous before they play competition here? Come on, be honest. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Always used to affect my serve. <laughs> I think nerves I think nerves are perfectly normal and nerves are good. I think they make you concentrate. I think the 
I, I don't think you ever find a way to calm them completely, but I think you can reassure yourself a lot with doing the best possible preparation that you can for the match that you're going to play. So whether that is scouting your opponent, making your notes of how you want to play, how you want to play the game, uh, whether it's something simple like um, often if we get nervous, we kind of freeze a bit and then we can't flow through the shots. So a really simple one when you're nervous is to keep your feet moving to keep, keep your, and keep yourself moving, to sh shake, shake the nerves out of your, your arms and your feet and, and, and keep yourself moving. Did you hear that one? Keep your feet moving, yeah? That, that uh, that's quite a simple one, so. but I think the, the preparation and writing everything down so that when you change ends, you can look into your racket bag and, and read your notes and remind yourself what it is that you want to focus on either in your game or to disadvantage the, the opponent. A lot, a lot of it is in the preparation. It was it um, fail to prepare and prepare to fail. Yeah. yeah, good. Happy with that one? Yeah. Some of these are a little bit more about Andy and Jamie now. Um, what would you say is the biggest difference between the absolute top players in the world compared to the others? Why do they keep winning? That was one that came up. I think a lot of that is um, how mentally strong you are. There's a lot of good players out there, but some of them get stuck, um, and some they'll get stuck at a certain certain ranking point. And the reasons for that could be something. There's a technical flaw in their game. Sometimes they're technically don't uh, tactically don't have a plan A or a plan. Uh, well, they have a plan A, but they don't have a plan B or a plan C. So they don't have enough variety in their game. Um, uh, sometimes it can be that they're, they're not good enough movers, they don't change direction quick enough, not enough speed off the mark, or they're not fit enough. Um, but usually the, what separates those who get to the very top is this ability to bring a great attitude every day to training and to competition, and a focus and an, in and an intensity on both the training court, but especially on the match court that doesn't yeah. allow them to get distracted. But at, actually think it's the ability to bring it every day is if you look at somebody like we spoke about just there like Nick Kyrgios he will come out with one or two huge wins will he ever win a Grand Slam probably not because you have to win seven matches across a 13-day period that takes incredible focus and intensity to keep your concentration for that period of time and bringing it yes. you know every day different opponent yeah. It's often different conditions, even if the court is the same, you can have sun, wind, all that, that yeah, sort of stuff. stuff yeah. But um, yeah, and, the, and if you look at the men's game, the, the guys especially who have dominated the top of the game for so long, they're the ones who've won either um, one or final or semis of the slams, Andy, Noko, uh, Djokovic, Rafa and Federer. What they've done as a four of them to dominate for that length of time it's been incredible, but they've also have pushed each other on. The, their level has pushed each other yeah. to, to achieve great things. I'm not sure we'll ever see that kind of no. domination again. No, I agree. Leading on to this, this one, um, when did you first think Andy could win Wimbledon? <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever remember thinking that. Um, that was from William. It's a, it's a good question. And <laughs> actually often get asked, you know, when did you think Andy was going to make it? You never know. You absolutely never know. Um, I think there are a lot of parents who think that their kids will do something great. Um, but you, you actually, you, you never know. I think all you can do as a parent and as a coach is to support and develop and inform and teach and nurture as much as you possibly can. But I think that when he beat his first top 100 player when he was 16 and won his first men's tournament, that was on the the lowest rungs of the tour and then the following year he won the US Open Juniors that was a very good sign and then the year after that when he was 18 he won his first ATP tour event and he beat Leighton Hewitt in the final and he was there on his own he was in San Jose at a men's event on his own his coach it was half term schools half term and he was away with his family so Andy went on his own with his girlfriend they were both 18 and he ended up beating Leighton Hewitt in the final who of course as a former world number one Grand Slam champion and so forth and I think that was at that point I was thinking I know he can do something great whether what he ended up doing I never would have imagined that 
he would do what he did or Jamie would do what he did or I would end up doing what I did when we started out at the tennis club at Dunblane. No chance I would have thought of that, but I think you just go step by step and you keep trying to add add and add and add and add and you study the competition and you speak to as many people and you learn as you as you go along yeah. but i think if you have the desire the belief the dedication and you work your butt off yeah. you know anything can happen and and actually anything did happen brilliant uh, this is a good question i think um, what's the hardest thing about having two sons who are tennis players Oh, it's the stress of watching them. Having to, I've had, been having to support them for so, so long. And actually, you would think it would be immensely enjoyable. And it's incredibly stressful. I think from the moment that they got up towards the top of the game, both of them, and the expectation from the public and from the media and from themselves became so huge. Um, and also, you start getting recognised everywhere and your life just changes completely. Um, I find it very stressful watching them and consequently I don't go very often now and if they're playing and it's on TV I tape it and if they win I'll watch it and if they don't win I just delete it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah you find your own way of, of coping with it but it's, it's, not as, it's not as fun as you might, as you might imagine. As I was chatting you to you uh, earlier today I, I spoke to you about a couple of girls we got in the college. Um, Hema and Ella, are they here? They should be here actually. Where are you girls? Stick your hands up. Oh, there you go, there you go. This, this question comes from um, one of them, Ella. It's a good question actually. Interesting, what were journeys home like when Andy and Jamie had played each other? <laughs> uh, two, two girls, so you obviously traveling home together when you played each other, yeah, okay. So That's not easy, is it? Not easy. That's not easy at all, but uh, you know, it's something that, if you are similar age, you, you, you kind of get used to it. I'm very glad that um, because they were 15 months apart, there were certain times when they did play against each other. They were in the same age groups. But when Andy went off to Barcelona to train when he was 15, that kind of stopped. And I was very grateful for that because when they played against each other, when they were young, I always hoped that Jamie would win because it was like the natural order of things because he was older. Because whenever Andy won, Andy was painful. Like he just goaded him all the time. And we were driving back from Solihull, tournament in Solihull. I was driving a minibus. I had 13 kids in the back of this minibus. And Andy had beaten Jamie in the final of the under 10 thing. And they started fighting in the back of the bus. I could see them in the, in the wing <laughs> mirror. And it, um, Andy had his hand on the, on the back of the seat. And Jamie punched his, punched his hand. And of course, Andy started to cry because it was bleeding and all the rest. I had to stop the bus, the first aid kit out, the nail was hanging off and blah, 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 blah. Kind of bandaged it up, separated them, continued to drive back up the M6 to the house. Anyway, it got all infected. I had to take him for a tetanus shot the next day. His nail does, hasn't grown in properly, as nails never do when they fall off. And, uh, but it was a real reminder to him of you never brag about actually never brag about beating anybody, never brag about beating your sibling. But I am very, very grateful that Andy went down a single route and Jamie went down a double route because that is much better for family harmony. There you go. Okay. Um, what future, this is a little bit different here now, but um, who is the next men's player to dominate Grand Slams like Rafa, Andy, Roger, Novak? Who, who, that's come from Tom and Eliza. Is there anybody you see in the men's game that could move on to that. You know, the, the one that just most recently is looking really, really good is Carlos Alcaraz, the Spaniard. I mean, he's only 18 and he's doing really, really great things. Who's so, from Spain here? Who's from Spain? Oh, there we go. I, I think you want to keep an eye on him. I think he's going to be something really special. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of good players, a lot of good players out there. But yeah. will anybody ever dominate on clay the way that Rafa did? Mm -hmm. Who, who well, knows? Yeah, who knows? Absolutely. It's just uh, incredible. Uh, from Tom and Eliza again, what future do you see for, for Emma Raducanu? I think she will be, um, I think she will be a great player. I mean, she's, she already is a great player. I think she obviously went so incredibly quickly and unexpectedly from, uh, you know, 
being in the qualifying for US Open to actually winning the title and nobody expected that and what most for the most part players go through a, a kind of a pathway where you learn the futures level the challenger level and then the tour level and you climb your way up <coughs> and she kind of absolutely leapfrogged everything and she's missed out a huge chunk so I think in lots of ways she's having to learn a lot as she goes along and I, I don't imagine in this first year she will get everything right I think so long as she has good people around her and I think she's still working around that she 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 stopped working with her coach last week and she's looking at a different setup once she works out what it is that she needs in terms of the right people around her um, her game is really good her attitude is excellent work ethic she's tactically smart and she's a great athlete so I don't see any reason at all why she can't be one of the leading women players for many years to come. She needs to approach you really, shouldn't she? <laughs> <laughs> you coach me, yeah? um, this is from Isabel. Um, what is the best piece of tennis advice that you've given to Andy and Jamie? This could be a tough one, but you know, what is, is there any piece of tennis advice you've given to Andy and Jamie that over the years that you felt I don't know that there's any one particular piece of advice. I mean, you know, ad your advice will change at different stages of the career in terms of what are the most, Im you know, what are the most important things. But I think something that relates to their tennis, but also relates to your values, is always used to say to them, you know, you can reach for the stars, but you keep your feet on the ground. You know, it's you have to dream, you have to believe, you, of course you have to, um, but you also have to remain humble and grounded and polite and appreciative of everybody who is around you, including your opponents, but also the people who helped you along the way. And I think that given the world that they live in, you know, the world of kind of tennis superstardom, um, it's very easy to go off the rails and become a bit diva and a bit distracted. Um, I'm very, very grateful that they, that they remain very, um, very humble, very grounded. Um, and, and I love it when people come up and say, oh, your boys are so polite or they're so whatever. The same sort of things that anybody's mom and dad would be really, really happy about. Um, and it's got nothing to do with whether they won a tennis match or not. So I, I think that whole reach for the stars, keep your feet on the ground, I think it's a good, solid piece of advice because we should always follow our, our dreams. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, this next one's from uh, Edward. Um, what is the most astonishing memory you have had from your time in tennis? Well, you've had a lot, but is there any, well? Yeah, I think, yeah, I've, I've got so many, so many memories, so many huge occasions in tennis. I mean, for sure, the, the boys winning the Davis Cup for Great Britain together in 2015 in Belgium, you know, Andy won two singles and Jamie and Andy together won the doubles. That gave them three that, that, that won the Davis Cup. That was, that was remarkable. But I think uh, going back to the semi-final of the Davis Cup that year, it was in Glasgow. And given what little I've told you about my tennis career, when I won national titles in Scotland, one man and his dog would be watching and you'd get one line in the roundup of the sports thing in the paper. You would never get any, any newspaper journalist covering it or any photos or anything like that because basically nobody was interested. And suddenly we had players, we had a Davis Cup captain, Leon Smith, who was also from Scotland, um, who uh, started on a coach apprenticeship with me when he was 20 and um, I kind of mentored him most of his pretty much all of his adult life and he's now the head of men's tennis, Davis Cup captain, very successful coach uh, and leader. But you know it was in Glasgow, there were 9,000 sellout crowd, the place was absolutely rocking, it was Davis Cup uh, semi against Australia and on the Saturday it was the doubles day and uh, Jamie and Andy were piped out onto the court by the Red Hot Chili Pipers and they were led out onto the court by, by Leon and I was sitting there with my phone you know just soaking up the atmosphere on my on, on my phone and actually thinking you know what I never would have imagined that we would have the World Cup of Tennis in Scotland with Scottish players and a Scottish captain and a sellout crowd and this incredible atmosphere I never would have envisaged that when I was your age and I think that will always remain with me because 
it made me realize that pretty much that started with me at the club uh, creating an environment in yeah. Dublin and then becoming the national the national coach it's and it really coach. hit me and, and I think that was a pff, wow. Yeah, wow look where we look how far we've all come amazing what a pathway. okay a uh, couple of other questions here um, one of the girls uh, Grace is Grace here tonight anyway here we go as a champion of women in sport and encouraging elite sports and athletes how important is it for children to keep on task and track at these difficult teenage years? Difficult teenage years, yeah. So as a champion of women in sport and encouraging elite sport and athletes, how important is it for children to keep on task and track at these difficult teenage years? Yeah, I think, I mean, I love sport and I love grassroots sport. I love recreational sport and I love performance sport. But I think it's not everybody wants to be a performer. Not everybody can be um, a performer. I think the most important thing is to enjoy being physically active, to enjoy the challenge of, of competition, um, to enjoy the, the camaraderie and, and to experience all the life skills that you can develop through being a part of sport. Um, and I think through the teenage years, it, it, it is of course, there's all sorts of other distractions coming in, not, not least exams and all the changes that you go through emotionally and physically um, through the teenage years. But I think that in sport, the social side of sport for me becomes even more important in terms of retaining girls in, through, through those yes. teenage years. You, you have to have things where you enjoy being with your, 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 your friends. Um, and I think there are a lot of times when coaches and sometimes teachers forget that side of things, um, that it all becomes about the teams and so forth, when actually we need a lot of, uh, a lot of recreational opportunity yes. to, to keep people, keep people playing. playing. We're going to do one more question before we go to all of you. Okay. Uh, and then after this one question, Judy and I are going to have 60 seconds just to take a drink of water. Um, and then we'll come to you if any of you want to ask a question. Is that okay? So you can be thinking about that now. But the last sort of question I'm going to ask now is what, to Judy, what advice do you have for aspiring coaches? This is from Anna. For aspiring coaches. I, I, I love coaching, I love, um, I, lo I love teaching and one of the things that I enjoy most about it is working out, depending on who's in front of me, is working out the right way to teach them that, that they will react in a positive way and learn from how it is that I'm, because we all learn differently and we are all unique, you know, in our own ways. But I think that my best piece of advice if you enjoy coaching is to find somebody that is great at what they do to work alongside and go and work alongside them because that is the fastest and quickest way to get good at something is actually to copy somebody who's already been doing it for a long time and who like your coach your tennis coaches here do a do a great job and they are great people and if you can create some work experience with with coaches that you admire who you know are good at what they do and they're good solid people that is probably my best piece of advice but also be curious learn for yourself there's so much great information out there on the internet and uh, and in books and so forth there's lots that you can learn for yourself um, from from others just by just by looking for it brilliant fantastic so far isn't it right now you've sat so quietly you can have a little chat with yourselves for a minute now okay you'll be pleased oh now here we go here we go <laughs> Oliver, go for it. Uh, what's your favourite surface to play on? Come on, Actually, probably, you, you can't beat a good clay court. A real proper red clay European court that's been pretty well baked and looked after, I think is an, you know, a very light top surface. On it. I don't think we, we don't get red clay right in this country, but if you go to a good European red clay court, I don't think you can beat that. That's a brilliant question, Oliver. Thank you. Um, wow. What was the key for your success and for the success of your 
So what was the key? So what was the key for your personal success? And for the success of both of your sons? I think probably a mix of determination and resilience. You know, just um, and uh, you know, really being willing to find out. I mean, f for me, when I had never had any track record of producing players before I became the Scottish national coach, so I was always having to look at what does a good 10-year-old look like? What does a good 12-year-old look like? What do I have to do in the next two years? What do I need to put in place? What are the right competitions to go to? I was always having to learn as I went along, and it was the same you know, with the, the boys. Obviously, Jamie went down a doubles route. Uh, Andy went, obviously, more on a singles route. But looking at what does top 500 look like? OK, what's the next step? It's 300. How many points do you need to get to 300? Where are you going to get those points? What are your best surfaces to get them on? What tournaments do we need to go to? And it was, it was very much learning as we went along. And it was just uh, blinkers on. That's what they want to do. And I'm the parent I need to try and help to find the, the right path for them to, in order to help them. And then, you know, nothing ever goes like that or, you know, in a straight line, it kind of goes a bit like this and then it's you know and there are always challenges and obstacles and things along the way and that's where the resilience kicks in or, or for the boys you know the whether it's whether it's a disappointing defeat or not being picked for something it is that whole resilience of pick yourself up and go again um, and so I think I probably a combination of both of those things but also a belief that it you know is possible it wasn't that I ever sort of thought or even, well, probably Andy did. He always kind of thought that he could get up to the top, but it was that sort of thing of, well, why not? What's next and what's next? But sometimes when you set a goal, if that goal is too far away, it becomes too difficult. And that's when you have to break it down into manageable chunks and go step by step. And then it becomes more doable. I think when we got our heads around that, that 500 went to 250, 250 went to 100, 100 went to 50, then 30, then 20 then 10 and 10 to 5 or 4 and then 4 how do you get to 1 how do you get to 1 well actually there's three people ahead of you you study them to death you have we had an absolute video library of, of, of their matches on all sorts of different surfaces and and that's what it comes down to is what do you have to do to get to the next stage and it can be different things at, at different stages but I think um, determination and resilience um, and willingness to willingness to learn and obviously to work hard is um, are, are right up there. Fantastic question, man. thank you very much. Can we have uh, one of the girls, Bibi? Um, hello, Mrs. Murray. Um, what do you think is the biggest barrier in driving visi um, driving visibility of women's sports, and what do you think male athletes could do to help drive visibility of women's sports? Right. Okay. Good question. Good question for yeah, good question. So it's a very good question. I spend a lot of time uh, ad addressing that. The, the need for visibility is, is key. If you can see it, you can, you can be it. Um, I think that the key, uh, well, to, to be fair, there, there has been a huge groundswell behind women's sport actually since the 2012 Olympics when we got a home Olympics. From the minute that it was announced that we got a home Olympics, huge additional resources were thrown at women's sport to ensure that we had a successful Olympics. Uh, we did have a successful Olympics and that really catapulted women's sport into the, the consciousness, not just, not just sport, but para sport um, as well. Um, the visibility is, is key to it. And, in, and in, order to, in order for it to be visible, for it to be tele, televisible, um, it needs to be great quality. So there, there needs to be a quality of investment in the pathway from participation to competition into performance because as soon as something is world class and it is, I want to watch that, it puts bums on seats, it puts eyes on screens, then sponsors come in, there is more investment and the whole thing kicks on. If it's not visible or it's not good enough, then 
we have a problem and, we're, and we start the fight again. But we're, we're actually in a really good place just now. I don't know if you saw a couple of weeks ago, there was a women's football match um, in Spain, Barcelona against Real Madrid. 93,000 people watched it, a women's football match. And the Six Nations women's rugby were having record crowds, I think 16,000 at you know, the l last weekend. It is definitely a starting to happen, but it's happening because there has, like the England women's rugby team are f all full time now. When they were all part time, they couldn't get good enough to be the best in the world. So you have to have a quality of investment in the performance to get it up to a level where people want to watch it and talk about it and get excited about it. So that's really where I come from on, on that. And, and obviously sport, like so many things, has been a male dominated domain traditionally and we've always been late to the party but it's going to be our party soon <laughs> can feel it <laughs> right um, can we have another girl question that's is that a victoria in the back i can i can put these bright lights that means yeah go on victoria far away Um, it, it is, it, the media and social media are very tough things for young athletes, as, whether they're male or female, but I think especially for female because we're probably more, um, I think we're more, I think we take things on, we get upset more by criticism. Th that's not to say that boys and men don't, I think we just take it on more, we take things more personally. And when I did uh, the TV series of Driving Force, uh, we, I interviewed 18 of Britain's most successful sportswomen. And there was a significant number of them who said that they really struggled with anxiety and depression following success because nobody prepared them for how to deal with success. You know, they prepared them for how to swim 800 meters faster than anybody in the world or sprint or kick a football or whatever. But as soon as they got that gold medal or that world title or whatever, and they were suddenly in the public eye and the media were writing about them and people were having a go at them on social media, good stuff and, and bad stuff. Nobody had prepared them for the life and business of being a successful athlete. So your life changes when you get that success. And so it's one of the one of the many things that Driving Force series has allowed us to highlight with governing bodies and management companies and sports coaches and teachers is that you have to prepare them not just for the sport, but for the life and business that goes around the sport. And I think that social media and tabloid media can be really brutal, really, really brutal. Be well, social media because you can hide behind a keyboard and tabloid media because they're trying to sell sell papers and it's very very tough on young athletes. Dina Asher Smith when I interviewed her she said that she dealt with it by just turning off her notifications. She puts she puts things on social media but she never looks at what people say. I mean most young people want to know what people say and they want to know where their likes are and their follows are and, and so forth but again that's where you need somebody to help you to to manage that because it can be incredibly debilitating if you allow it if you allow it to, or if you're not prepared properly on how to deal with it. It, it can be quite scary. Good question. Okay, another one. Um, go on. Sorry, I can't see the proper level. Yeah. Go on, ask, ask the question. Um, yeah, did you have any rivalries in your career as a player? And also, this is from my mom. Is it true that Adley tied his wedding ring in his shoelaces? <laughs> Good question from your mum. Yeah, I didn't. I, I didn't really have rivalries. Well, I suppose I did within Scotland, and one of the reasons why I no longer play like veterans tennis, like um, the over 35s and 45s and all that sort of stuff, I never got into that because my main rival in Scotland played all that stuff, and I thought I'm not going through all that again. Played her all my career. I'm not playing her in that veteran stuff. So. That's one of the, actually one of the reasons why I, why I don't play. And the story of, of the wedding ring, yes, Andy ties his wedding ring on his shoelace of his trainers when he plays. And he's always done that since he got married in 2015. And last year at Indian Wells Tennis Tournament, 
he has very smelly feet. And in the, uh, Indian Wells, it was very humid, very hot, and his uh, tra trainers um, that he had tied the wedding ring onto, he took them off when he got into the car and put another pair on, but didn't take his wedding ring off. And when he parked the car at the hotel, he said the shoes were smelling so bad. He said, I didn't want to put them in my room because they would have stunk in my room. If I'd put them outside my room in the corridor, somebody probably would have, would have pinched them. So he said, I put them underneath the car. I mean, who does that? How frequently do your sons have to train to reach that incredible level? Yeah, it, it's, it's a good question. And it's, um, I would say that in a training week uh, or, or training block, they'll have it all planned out how much time they're spending on court. And the time on court will be broken down into serving, serve and return, playing points, working on, you know, working on particular things. Uh, sometimes it's being fed balls from the coach, sometimes it's playing against two people against one so that you get lots of balls coming back. And sometimes it'll be playing practice points against one other person or maybe two other people. So it's, they play two points on, two points off. It really, um, it depends and obviously you have to prepare on different surfaces. You have to prepare indoor and out, depending on where the next tournament is. You have to prepare in different different conditions, you know, whether it's sunny. Make sure you play on each side of the court. Sun in your eyes, sun on, sun on your back, humidity. There's so many different things that, that come into it. Um, if you're preparing for a, for a Grand Slam that's, that's best of five sets, you have to do three hour training sessions because a match can last three, four or five hours. So if you only train for an hour and a half, you're not preparing yourself for what that tournament could throw at you. Um, if you are playing in a competition, how you train the day of the competition and the day in between the competitions is completely different. Um, probably much, much, much shorter. But in a training block, you're trying to put, uh, trying to put the volume in. So it, it constantly changes and it absolutely depends on the phase that you're in. Are you in a training phase, competition phase, specific competition phase? It's all, uh, it's all, it all it, the planning is incredibly important. Um, can we give Judy a massive round of applause? <laughs> 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 everybody. <laughs> um, can you state your hand up if you're out on the tennis course with me tomorrow? I love it. Okay, well I will be ready to put you through your paces uh, out there tomorrow, whichever session you're coming along to. Um, and I will have some surprises at the end of each session, so be ready for that.